Great, okay, so I think we're ready to start. So welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're discussing the results of the 2019 Forest 500 report, which was published this morning. I'm Emma Gollard for Global Canopy and hosting today's webinar. So just a few housekeeping things. We'll be recording this webinar and we'll share a link with you afterwards. Um, and also we will be, there will be a Q&A at the end. So um, please do use the Q&A box and the chat box to send in your questions at any time during the presentations. We will um, we'll go through them at the end. Please include your name and organization so that we are able to get back to you if, for example, we aren't able to answer all the questions during the webinar. Um, so um, on the screen now is the agenda for um, the hour that we have for the webinar. And I'd like to start really by introducing our speakers. First of all, with me is Sarah Rogerson, who is the Forest 500 project lead here at Global Canopy, and also Emma Thompson, who is our Forest 500 researcher. We are also delighted to welcome Leah Sandberg and Sam Davies as our guest speakers discussing the report's finding. Leah Sandberg is a scientist with the Rainforest Alliance's Global Programs and a member of the Accountability Framework Initiative's backbone team. Leah also leads the AFI's workstream on reporting and assessment. And Sam Davies is a campaigns manager at WWF, leading on business engagement for the Zero Deforestation Food Campaign. Sam previously played a role in the Global Forest and Trade Network, supporting UK businesses in forest management. So um, we're delighted, Sam and Leah, to have you both here today. Um, so we'll um, move on to the presentations now. Um, first of all, I'd like to hand over to Sarah and Emma, who are going to tell us about the report. Um, Sarah, do you want to start? Thanks a lot, Emma. So it is a fact that we are in the midst of a climate and a nature emergency. And it also bears repeating the huge importance of forests in helping to mitigate both of those crises. Tropical forests contain over 80% of the world's documented species. And existing forests absorb approximately one third of the carbon emitted by burning fossil fuels each year. But forests are currently hugely undervalued by our current economic system. For instance, our partners on the New York Declaration of Forest Assessment Group have highlighted that forest projects currently get only 1.5% of the finance that's going to climate solutions. That amount of funding becomes even more minuscule if you compare it to the amount of funding that's going into sectors that drive the destruction of forests, including agriculture and commodity supply chains. The Amazon fires last year drew attention to the plight of our tropical forests, causing some organizations to make pledges or statements on reducing deforestation. However, many organizations are still making statements on climate, which do not explicitly include any acknowledgement of the role of ending deforestation. For instance, organizations such as BlackRock have made really high profile statements on tackling climate, but they don't have any policies on forests at the moment. So Forest 500 is an initiative of Global Canopy that started in 2014 to track company and financial institution commitments on deforestation. This is the sixth year of our rankings and the sixth annual report. Important year. The end of this year is a deadline for many company and government goals to end deforestation. But we've known for a while that these will be missed, as we reported last year, but also highlighted in a recent report from IDH, which used trace and forest 100 data, and showed that we're behind on deforestation commitments for all commodities. But really, worst of all, is that deforestation rates have actually gone up by around 40% since most of these commitments were made, despite a year on year increase in the number of commitments. It's time to take stock, work out what's gone wrong and what needs to change, and also what's gone right, because there are some positives from the last five years. Many companies will have set commitments with absolutely no idea how to achieve them, but will now have more experience in what to do and how to do it. And there's more resources like the accountability framework, which now exists to bring greater guidance to companies. Deforestation has also, also noticeably moved up the agenda among companies, among consumers, and also among policymakers. Forest 500 provides insight into which of the most exposed companies and financial institutions are committed and trying to implement those commitments to tackle deforestation, committed but are not transparently implementing at the moment, and also those that are still doing absolutely nothing on deforestation. 
This is still really important to keep tracking as we pass the previous 2020 goalposts to hold the organizations to account. We may not have another 10 years to save our forests. Thanks, Sarah, that was a great introduction. Um, Emma, I was wondering, can you tell us now a bit about the methodology that's used in the Forest 500? So the Forest 500 identifies the 350 most influential companies in forest risk quality supply chains, and then identifies the 150 financial institutions that provide the most finance to those 350 companies. Um, we review the sample every other year to ensure that we capture any changes in the markets and continue to include the most influential power brokers within our annual assessments. Um, every year we assess the 500 companies and financial institutions on their commitments or policies to tackle the deforestation that they are exposed to. For companies, this comes through the forest risk commodities they're exposed to through their supply chains. And for financial institutions, this comes through the companies that are included in their financial portfolios. So we look at only publicly available information um, and then we assess companies for their commitments for their suppliers and then assess financial institutions on their commitments for their companies in their portfolios. So firstly, we assess the power brokers on their overall approach to deforestation and then we review the strength, scope and ambition of their commitments and policies. We then also assess the companies and financial institutions on their reporting and implementation of these commitments. Uh, so that includes indicators on transparency, progress reporting, and whether they disclose how they monitor their suppliers or portfolio companies for compliance. Great, thanks Emma. So what does this mean for the 2019 report and the findings um, on the companies that you assessed? So although there are some relative leaders among the 350 companies, there are actually many more laggards which are holding the rest of the companies back. So voluntary commitments Voluntary deforestation commitments, as they are, have failed to drive the change needed. Out of the 350 companies we assessed this year, 140 did not have any deforestation commitments for any of the commodities that they are exposed to through their supply chains. This shows no change since 2018. Collectively, these companies without deforestation commitments are the laggards of the Forest 500. Um, many of these laggards are hidden relatively deep within complex supply chains, uh, so they often escape scrutiny just because we can't recognize them. Um, however, some of them are much more recognizable. So as you can see on the screen, uh, they, companies which we classify as laggards include CK Hutchinson Holdings, which owns Superdrug, Capri Holdings, who own Jimmy Choo and Versace, and Amazon. So as you can see from this map, uh, the map shows the proportion of companies which are considered laggards in each region, um, meaning that they have no deforestation commitments for any of the commodities that they are assessed for. And so, as you can see, in the bottom half of each circle, uh, you can see the number of companies assessed in each region. Uh, and then above that, you can see the percentage of those companies which are laggards. So, as you can see, companies headquartered in Europe and North America were the most likely to make deforestation commitments with only 21% and 20% of companies in those regions respectively uh, failing to make a deforestation commitment for any of the commodities. So as you can see uh, in North America, that includes Purina, the cat food manufacturer, and in Europe, that includes Presidente, the cheese manufacturer. Um, if you could then look at companies based in South America, Asia Pacific, and Africa, you can see that they are also less likely to have a deforestation commitment for any of the commodities. Um, than the other regions, with 67%, uh, 41%, and 50% failing to make commitments respectively. So the holding companies in those regions include those which own brands such as Havaianas, Yakult, Bertoli, and Samsonite. So as the slide also shows, you can see that 100% of the companies headquartered in Russia, and also 80% of those headquartered in China, do not have any publicly accessible deforestation commitments on their website at all. However, it's important to note that this problem cannot solely be defined by geography. So company action also varies by commodity. We've noticed that some commodities that have been a little bit more in the public eye in recent years tend to get more attention from companies and therefore more commodity specific deforestation commitments. So this can be seen for palm oil whereas soy, beef and leather face particularly high levels of inaction. 
As you can see on the slide, 81% of companies have failed to make deforestation commitments for leather, 79% failed to make them for beef, and 73% of those assessed for their exposure to soy didn't have deforestation commitments. So despite many companies recently publicly condemning the drivers of the 2019 Amazon fires, they've simultaneously been failing to make their own commitments to pre prevent their supply chains from contributing to this deforestation through the three commodities at the core of these fires, beef, leather, and soy. The voluntary nature of commitments and the fact that transparency is also optional enables many companies to hide under the radar. 2020 was supposed to be the year when many companies which had signed up to the New York Declaration on Forests and the Consumer Goods Forum Resolution would have achieved zero net deforestation in their supply chains. And we've known for quite some time that these commitments are unachievable, but our 2019 assessments found that some companies were actually beginning to dial down their ambition on tropical deforestation. In last year's assessments, 157 companies had a deforestation commitment with a deadline of 2020 or earlier. Since then, 18 of those companies have removed the deadline from their commitment, and further four have abandoned those commitments completely. The quiet dropping of these commitments and deadlines shows a lack of transparency on company action on tropical deforestation. Companies are getting away with not explaining that they are removing or weakening their deforestation commitments. Companies with 2020 commitments need to be transparent on how and why their deforestation commitments were unachievable and the steps that they're going to take to remedy this. It can no longer be considered as acceptable for companies to not report on their progress towards their deforestation commitments. So, as some of you may know, last year we introduced some new assessment indicators to our company assessment methodology. Uh, where we particularly focused on assessing how companies are implementing their commitments on the ground. Um, so we assess companies for both their commitment strength score and reporting and implementation score. Uh, so the reporting and implementation score includes whether companies report on their progress towards their commitments, if they verify compliance in their supply chains, uh, and if they publicly report their direct suppliers or sourcing regions, among several other indicators. Uh, this year's assessment uh, found that 48% of companies with at least one deforestation commitment did not report on their progress to implement them. This lack of transparent reporting prevents organisations like ourselves from identifying the difference between real company action and greenwash. So as you can see on the screen, based on the publicly reported information on their websites, brands including A will see all scored far less for implementation than for their commitment strength score. So one interpretation of the disparity between these scores could be that companies are greenwashing. They seem to have the policies and commitments in place, but are not implementing them on the ground. Without an increase in transparency on the action companies are taking and their progress towards these commitments, it's impossible to differentiate between companies which are greenwashing and companies which are merely failing to disclose their progress towards these commitments. We also assess 150 financial institutions that provide the most finance for the companies identified. But 68% of these did not have any policies for the commodities that we looked at. So only 32% had any deforestation commitments. As Emma explained earlier, financial institutions are assessed for all four commodities due to their exposure to each through different companies and sectors that they'll be financing. In spite of this, only one in five of the financial institutions we assessed had deforestation commitments for all of them. So with 102 of the most influential financial institutions not having a deforestation policy for any of the forest risk commodities, it's clear that the finance sector is still not making enough progress to achieve deforestation-free portfolios or contribute to deforestation-free supply chains. So, uh, as we saw with companies, soy and cattle products continue to face higher levels of inaction than the other two commodities based on the policies implemented by financial institutions. So, as some of you might remember, in October this year, or last year, sorry, uh, over 200 financial institutions signed a statement requesting companies to halt deforestation in the Amazon. However, only 14 of those financial institutions are among the financial institutions with the most influence on tropical deforestation. 
Further, only seven of those original 14 institutions which are included in the Forest 500 have any deforestation policies at all. And only four of those have deforestation policies for all commodities that we assess them for. This small sample is a, an indicator of a much bigger picture. In 2019, we found that 67% of financial institutions didn't have a deforestation policy for soy and 71% didn't for cattle products despite these commodities being the primary causes of tropical deforestation in the Amazon. Although this level of inaction is shocking, it is important to note that little action is being taken on palm oil or timber products either, as you can see on the screen. For both of these commodities, 63% of financial institutions failed to make deforestation policies. As, of, as we said earlier, out of the 150 assessed, only 28 financial institutions had policies for all commodities. While these financial inst institutions, including Standard Chartered and Santander, are leading the way, these 28 acting alone cannot drive the entire sector forward. Despite their pivotal role in the deforestation economy, it's clear that financial institutions are collectively taking insufficient action on their impact on tropical deforestation. So, as we are now into 2020, uh, it's clear that neither companies or financial institutions are taking adequate action on forest risk commodity supply chains. Be a catalyst for renewed pressure on companies and financial institutions to eliminate deforestation in their supply chains, and also for civil society and consumers to hold them accountable for their impacts on tropical deforestation. But for this to be effective, there is also a need for greater pressure from governments through methods including due diligence across both consumer and producer countries alike. However, the companies and financial institutions are the ones that hold the power here. They too must accept their role in tropical deforestation economy and take action to improve the other companies they interact with or finance. Companies that already have commitments can work to map their supply chains and place pressure on their suppliers to comply with their commitments. Financial institutions must also take responsibility and ensure that their policies cover all four forest risk commodities and that they are consistently applied to all of their companies they finance in their portfolios. 2020 provides an unparalleled opportunity to drive change throughout the deforestation economy. But as our report shows, voluntary commitments alone can no longer be relied on to do this. Cohesive efforts must be made by civil society, consumers, governments, companies and financial institutions alike to drive effective and sustainable change throughout forest risk commodity supply chains. Great, thanks Emma. Great, so the new data and the latest report are available on our newly launch, launched website, uh, which you can find at forest500.org, as you can see on the screen. And we've added some new features to help display the huge amount of data we've been collecting annually since 2014. So, yeah, so you can go to the website and find the annual report on our homepage. So you can click through and get that as a PDF. You can also see our insights and our blogs. If you navigate to the data page, you can download our full data for company assessments and for financial institution assessments. And you can also access links to the methodologies of how we select them and how we rank them. On the rankings pages, you can see company rankings or financial institution rankings. Um, and you can filter by keyword or by their score or by some of the information for companies and then see the data down below. You can change the year and you can also download the data that you're looking at or the full data again. Financial institution rankings page works very similarly. You can also filter by financial institution type or headquarters. So you can look at all of the companies at once if you're interested and you can sort by their score or look at what they're assessed for or their scores for certain sections of the assessment. And if you're interested in a company in more detail, you can click to expand and see their scores 
set out by commodity, by each commodity that they're assessed for. Or you can click on their company profile where you can get the full assessment information. So here you can also expand those commod commodity scores and see the underlying data and why we assess them the way that we did. So you can access the quote that we found and the link to the source material. So please do check it out. Great, thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Emma, as well. Thank you. That was really useful. Um, so just quickly to remind everyone, um, there will be time uh, shortly for your questions. So please do type them into either the Q&A or the chat function, and we'll um, be taking them shortly. Please, when you do, don't forget to include your name and organisation. So, so now I'd like to bring in Leah and Sam as well for the discussion. So we have Leah Samberg with us from the Accountability Framework Initiative, leading on reporting and assessment, and Sam Davies from WWF UK, who leads on business engagement for the Zero Deforestation and Food campaign. So Sam and Leah, welcome. We're delighted to have you both here um, and to be able to ask you for your reflections on the report's findings, um, but also, of course, to ask what now, um, now that we are in 2020 and this is the situation. So, um, Leah, Sam, you're on the line, just to check that you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Great, thanks, Leah. Yep, yeah, perfect. So, Leah, maybe if we just start um, with the AFI, because we've mentioned it a few times in the presentations just now, Sarah and Emma referred to it. Um, so, I was wondering it would be helpful maybe if you could just give an introduction for those who aren't familiar with it. Uh, just to start us off there. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so the Accountability Framework Initiative is a collaborative effort uh, built by a group of 15 environmental and human rights NGOs to improve accountability for ethical supply chain commitments in agriculture and forestry by setting and clarifying global expectations and best practices for setting, implementing, and demonstrating progress towards these supply chain commitments. So uh, after a two-year development process, the framework itself was launched in June of 2019, and it provides a set of 12 core principles that define good practice in supply chain commitments uh, across all commodities in all regions. And then those principles are supported by a whole series of um, operational guidance documents, um, giving much more depth on, on um, how those principles may be implemented. And then finally, uh, it includes a glossary of commonly agreed upon definitions for all the key terms related to these topics. Leah, thanks. That's, that's helpful. So thinking about that and what we've been hearing about the deadlines that are being missed and that even some organizations are perhaps weakening commitments, um, what what does the uh, um, you know, like what does the AFI recommend for for such companies who've missed their deforestation targets? What would be like what's your approach now to those companies and the message that you would be giving them and 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 how you see this moving forward? Right, absolutely, and I think um, you know for starters it, it is very in line with with the way you presented it as well um, because I think for, you know first of all it's really important to remember that the intention of this whole accountability community is to increase our ability to recognize and apply pressure to actors that are not performing responsibly and to reward and incentivize progress towards responsible production and sourcing. Um, and to that end, um, transparency is pretty much always the answer um, to, to these questions. And uh, what that means is that, in this case, is that you know, AFI expects that uh, companies will not remove their deadlines uh, from these commitments, will not set new commitments to a later date, um, and rather that accurate reporting should acknowledge that commitments were missed and provide information on how they're moving forward. Um, we, they should continue to set time-bound milestones and targets to provide an ongoing measurable basis for assessment of their progress post-2020, and this is a, a key component of the framework's core principles on sort of specifying commitments, um, is really the importance of time-bound milestones that allow for continued assessment of progress, even, even past in this deadline. And then finally, that they should um, carry out appropriate analysis to identify the factors that led them to miss those deadlines and to work to overcome barriers to action. And that's really where we see the accountability framework 
fitting in as it was designed with this explicit purpose of helping companies accomplish these targets in a stepwise and effective way. Um, so we'd really recommend that companies looking to move forward in the face of these missed targets use uh, the framework's principles and guidance to analyze, assess, um, and prior, you know, improve their policies and systems and prioritize improvement processes based on that going forward. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think some of what we've been hearing for companies is that it, you know, it's genuinely really hard and maybe there was some underestimation when those deadlines were set. But now, now the question is how, yeah, as you were saying, how, how do we help leaders and laggards both to set and maintain commitments um, which are achievable and yet also have that sense of urgency. Um, so Sam, I'd like to bring you in too. Um, maybe um, thinking perhaps about um, what mechanisms there may be um, to achieve this and, and whether you think the role of due diligence, um, it, you know, if there's something there which would change this picture and, and yeah, what your thoughts are around due diligence, but also anything else that you think can, can help um, with where we are now. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much for that. Thanks for the for the overview. Um, yeah, I mean, just before I get started, I'd like to make clear kind of what what we at WWF had initially planned. We uh, when we were thinking about building a deforestation free food campaign, um, we were focusing on kind of asking companies to um, establish more robust commitments um, in line with the AFI. So basically, adopting the AFI guidelines um, to deliver on. On, deliver the deforestation free supply chains that we so desperately need um, and although that is still a focus that is still we, we are still asking companies to do that we are now asking companies to also we are, we're asking companies primarily as part of the new campaign focus to advocate um, I think what Forest 500 report has clearly nailed down I think it nailed down especially in its latest report is that um, yeah deforestation number of commitments majority of commitments are going to fail and deforestation is going to remain um, embedded in our supply chains. So the way that we see it, how we get around that is kind of taking, taking that, uh, I guess, that power away from businesses to fail and to implement legislation um, and le legislation in the form of due diligence. Because um, of course, I mean, the, we, the opportunity to actually to make the, diff the change that we need um, need to see is that that, that window is is cl uh, slowly clo closing or quickly closing. So we need kind of um, uh, action on a UK and international level to actually uh, address this properly. We need we need to change course before we before kind of re reinstating more commitments that will inevitably fail if we're if we're going to take into consideration what's already ha uh, gone before. Um, so yeah, as part of uh, WWF's new uh, deforestation zero deforestation food campaign or fight for our forest campaign which will launch publicly on uh or next week uh we'll be calling on government to implement world leading legislation by the end of 2020 um oh, so a deforestation free target and legislation by the end of 2020 um and that would then place a legal due diligence obligation on businesses to identify and remove deforestation from high risk food supply chains by the end of 2021 so there, there will be that grace period and there will be that kind of uh, delivering on commitments that we do, that again, like I said, we so desperately need to. It, it gives businesses that control, um, but there is that deadline. You, businesses will be accountable after 2021. That's that's what we're calling for. Um, and of course, there's a question of, of, of what we mean when we say due diligence. I mean that that is a, a blanket term. Um, there is a number of ways in which different NGOs um, would would expect due diligence to be implemented, um, whether it should cover one commodity or multiple commodities. Um, just looking at EUTR, for example, uh, that's a form of due diligence on legality um, over only over the, the timber, uh, timber pulp and paper, that, those commodities. Um, so it's whether or not we want to see that due diligence, that type of due diligence, or whether, whether we want um, a broader due diligence across multiple commodities and the onus would then be on different the onus to deliver on those uh, commitments would then be on uh, different companies throughout the supply chain. Um, it's of course easier said than done. I mean, businesses have a significant role to continue playing. I mean, as I said, they need to deliver on these commitments. They need to they need to um, deliver on the commitments and also support us in delivering legislation. Um, government need to hear that businesses want this. I mean, what we hope is that sustainability business leaders in, uh, on sustainability will be able to kind of back us up and demonstrate that they are doing their very best, but there are barriers, there are challenges, and maybe legislation um, is the best way to, 
confront that. Um, so we're hoping, yeah, so as part of the, the campaign, as part of going to government, businesses will be able to support us. Um, of course, I, I think due diligence, we're kind of well aware of that, the fact that due diligence in itself is, 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 is great, um, but the actual implementation of and the enforcement of is, is going to be a key part of it. Um, I think, as I, as I mentioned previously with the EUTR, although it was a tremendous step in the right direction, and it is, it, it is doing a great job, um, its implementation and its enforcement isn't, isn't a huge deterrent at the minute. I think, I think the last company that, that got fined under the EUTR was only 13,000 pounds or in, in, in the region of. Um, so it's not a huge deterrent for, for companies um, to kind of, yeah, get their, get their, their due diligence in order. Um, and there's also a question around, you know, agricultural practices on the ground. Um, due diligence is great um, in the UK and at a government level in the UK. Um, but to be able to actually see the, the results that we want to see, um, we need to provide businesses and supply chains with other opportunities and um, other options. So if sustainable agricultural practices uh, you know, are, are then kind of kept competitive with unsustainable agricultural practices, um, that, that it would be kind of a no-brainer option, which is something we also need to consider. Sam, thanks. Um, Leah, did you want to add um, to what Sam's been saying there? No, I think that, that covers it well. Great, okay. So I was just um, reflecting uh, a bit, I suppose, on um, uh, I suppose the map in a way that Emma showed and one interpretation of the data was around where the commitments are, where we're seeing more commitments um, and whether do you think that it, what are the drivers of that is due diligence now already even you know even with where we are in the development of due diligence in Europe having an effect already or is, do you see that as part of the explanation um, or are there other factors I don't know perhaps there's just more you know maybe there's more consumer awareness which has a, a difference um, and then to think if, um, you know, even if those things are perhaps playing out in Europe and we're starting to see that and in North America, what, you know, what effect does that have globally if it's not in place in other regions um, and how you would, yeah, maybe reflect on that. I don't know if you um, feel that that's beginning to have an influence or if that's just an interpretation of the map. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fair interpretation. I think, um, I think general awareness of, of, of kind of linking deforestation with food for example is is low is lower than we'd like um and i think uh we're kind of in a bubble uh in that sense as well so i think in other countries such as uh china for example who their, their soy um uh consumption uh their embedded soy consumption anyway is uh growing because they're not the, the perception um, across the world isn't the same as what it is in the UK and what it is in, uh, throughout EU, EU and America. And that's something we will need to consider and will need to tackle. Um, and we recognize obviously that um, due diligence in the UK is just kind of one step in a very long process, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, the UK, I think, is the fifth largest economy in the world, um, which means it has a seat at the table. So therefore, it has an influencing power. I mean, obviously, we're losing some of that um, by leaving the EU. The EU is then going to be... An, uh, uh, a, a kind of another large step for us, especially from WWF UK's perspective. But fortunately, we have a network that can can support deforestation-free commitments and deforestation-free um, legislation. Um, and the UK has a, obviously has a, a disproportionately large uh, footprint compared to its own land area. Um, it can't ignore that. It has to it has to be able to um, uh, address that if it is to become if it is to kind of achieve its ambition of becoming a world leader um, on, on environment. Um, so as part of uh, WWF deforestation campaign, we're trying to address how obviously the major drivers of deforestation, such as, um, such as where the commodities are coming from, they, the countries that they are coming from are also part of the conversation and part of, part of the action that we're, that, that we're kind of doing by ourselves in the UK. It, it, it's, it's not just, just because it's coming into the UK, we, we, we'll, just, we'll just make that part of the supply chain, the good part of the supply chain, but then you know, we'll, we'll carry on doing you know, all the naughty stuff over here because other countries don't care. They need to be part of that process. They need to be, they need to make, we need to make sure that their, their entire operations of the suppliers are, are sustainable across the board if we're, to, if we're going to have a, a, global, a global impact. And that is the second part of the campaign. Um, 
the the focus the primary focus is uk legislation but it's how we replicate that um globally how we replicate that um uh, 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 across other countries um and primarily the key countries like like china and india yeah thanks sam so so really looking at re-exports and and global supply chains and where where those things are coming from and where they're ending up as well as part of that picture yeah um, so thinking about that as well and how complex those supply chains are, um, how can we then increase pressure on the, the sort of invisible company names, as it were, the ones who, who aren't recognisable brands, perhaps? How, what would you suggest um, for, for that? Yeah, <laughs> um, it's, it's a tough one because it's something, I mean, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it, it, I feel it's something I think we've tried to do a great deal, you know, we whether we've approached um, we've approached the public-facing companies to make sure that, that you know, uh, the, yeah, the, the M and S's, the, the Tesco's, you know, the ones that people actually know, we've approached them and asked to make sure that their supply chains are um, adhering to their robust commitments, uh, if they have any. Um, but clearly, like you said, for deforestation is still on the rise and it doesn't seem to be working so yeah so without sounding like a broken record i feel to get the laggards in line with the leaders that's that's why we feel legislation is is kind of the next obvious step we we feel that it, that it, with the the com the, well, the the commitments that are going are going to be made have already been made we we feel i mean that's something that we found in our timber scorecard in 2019 i know obviously it relates to timber where there are a lot of commitments but there wasn't a great deal of progress between 2017 and 2019 um, yeah, the, com the companies that already made the commitments, they made in them and some of them were working against them. Um, but the laggards that were identified in the 2017 and 2015 scorecard were the same as the 2019. They just, they don't feel that pressure. Um, and what we've tried do doesn't seem to be working. So <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure really if I've, if I've answered the question or if, if I've kind of sh shone a light on anything, but that's why we feel legislation is, is the next step is to, is to kind of catch catch everybody that, that that's part of the supply chain so nobody can nobody can hide away sure okay thanks um yeah um so leo yeah just thinking more perhaps um then practically and how this all comes together um thinking about the data that we now have for us 500 is in its sixth year so you know it has now data um which we can look back on and how do you have any thoughts about how we can use the data on commitments and also on implementation to have impact on these issues as they become more urgent? And, and maybe also thinking a bit about the disparities that we saw between the different commodities and, and why that is. Leah, can you? Can yes. You, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, you know, it's a good question as, as we, you know, continue to um, collect these data and collect more data um, and um, you know, part of the accountability framework right now um, with, you know, with all of you on, on, the, on this call about, um, or with the folks at Global Canopy and others about um, trying to increasingly standardize and harmonize and, and improve the way that we um, collect and, and understand these data. Um, you know, the next question really definitely is how do we, how do we use that to have, have as much impact as we can um, and certainly there's lots of different avenues for that. Um, you know, looking forward, I think that um, you know, the finance, finance sector certainly has you know, always to go, as you've discussed, but seems to be a space where these data really can be readily used to inform decision making um, by investors and, and financiers. And it's, it seems like one of the, the real leverage points that we'll have going forward in this conversation. And that requires us making sure that both we're asking for and supporting the type of information from companies that will actually be useful to those actors. And also that we're effective at identifying priority indicators um, that financial institutions can and should use, um, you know, out of the, the many, many various ESG indicators, um, et cetera, that are floating around out there. So trying to figure out how to strengthen that, that pathway, which um, I think, you know, has a benefit of being able to be a pathway both for leading and well-known companies, but also for, um, for laggards or for lesser known companies that still need to sort of have access to those, to those instruments. So that seems to be, you know, a way forward in this. Um, also, um, you know, I think that more effective and standardized um, data analysis uh, from 
of upstream companies for their buyers um, will be essential for, for downstream companies um, making more informed decisions about sourcing that really, that really succeed in driving progress on their commitments. I think there's a lot of increasing conversation about um, having you know companies holding their suppliers accountable for their commitments all, all all through their operations and not just in their in their own footprint and doing that requires you know a huge amount of of data and information on those companies and what they're doing so figuring out how to better um transmit that data in a way that's interpretable um quickly feels like a really important next step also to really have impact yeah, Leah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask our panelists one more question and then we're going to throw it out to the Q&A. So um, we've been talking a lot about uh, companies, but obviously the report also looks at financial institutions. So I wondered um, how you both were, you know, feel um, that we can sort of, how do the financial institutions get on board with this and understand that they have a role to play in this? I think for from you know companies increasingly it's clear whether they take action or not that you know it's clear that there there's a direct role but for financial institutions many of them seem still to feel that they are detached from that so um yeah what what is the next step there and what can what, what needs to change how do we engage how you know how does the community engage with financial institutions Sam, is this something that you um that WWF looks at? Yeah, so it's something that we are developing as part of the campaign. I mean, it's a question of whether we're looking at whether finance can play, a, whether, whether the, it's, a, it's a finance system change or whether finance or finance businesses can, can play a role. And it's also what kind of makes sense to them. Um, um, it's a lot easier, isn't it? I think when, when we're kind of developing a campaign, we want to make something that, 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 you know, everybody can sink their teeth into. And when you're talking to, Although it, we can make the connection that um, finance are fueling, you know, uh, financial institutions are investing in deforestation, essentially, um, making that leap, um, like for consumers, for example, is it, it would be quite different or quite difficult, um, as is making the leap between uh, soy in your meat and you're eating meat. So therefore, the soy is causing deforestation, you're causing deforestation. Um, yeah, so it, it, is, it, it is quite difficult. So we're looking at other options around whether it's, um whether it it's yeah are we are we are we looking at how how financial institutions invest directly into landscapes uh, in, into um landscapes that are being deforested and in what way so we're looking at whether how how people interact with those with these banks and financial institutions and how that interaction then leads to deforestation such as uh pensions for example um but it's something we're still developing i don't think it's something we've um necessarily nailed down at the minute i wouldn't be able to speak to it in great depth and expertise unfortunately but um yeah if, if anybody else wants to follow up with me i can i can find the right people in the building to be able to answer those questions great thanks leah did you want to add anything um only to say that you know i think that um certainly a lot of organizations are, are working on, on just this question and it seems like there has to me at least that there has lately been some really um sort of promising increases at least in the sort of investor space it seems like the um you know some of the the banks and, and things like that are coming more slowly but that conversation is certainly ongoing and i think that um you know what we can be doing from our end is is figuring out again how to have a put a sort of a clear and simple message for what um what our ask is of them in this regard um and as a as a data person that's a lot of of this this conversation right now is what are the what are the specific data that we should be asking them to um, to make decisions on, and how can we make that as clear and simple and effective as possible? Um, you know, what are the what are the things we really think are the are the leverage points that that they can access? So I think from our end, that's that's a big piece of the of the question. I think from um, you know in terms of getting getting them on board with this project in the first place, I think there's a much larger you know conversation about about climate risk and um, and things like that that are, are certainly outside of my um, my purview, but it seems like that conversation is moving in, in a really interesting direction. And um, yeah, I think whatever we can do to sort of support that with with providing the the, the data information feels feels like a really important piece of the puzzle right now. 
Thanks, thanks, Leah. So, um, yeah, we've got questions coming in. If you haven't submitted yours yet, there's still time. So please still use the Q&A box or the chat box for sending in your questions. So we're going to start taking the ones that are coming in here now. And some of these are also for Emma and Sarah. Um, so Leah and Sam also feel free to jump in um, if you uh, want to answer any of these questions. So I think um, possibly Emma may be your best place to answer this first one, which has come in from Javier Ortiz at the uh, TFA in Colombia and Peru, asking what media is being used to report so that the general public or consumers can better know about companies' commitments? Yeah, so this year we're making a real effort to make sure that uh, the progress uh, or lack of progress that companies are making is understood by consumers and um, so it kind of escapes the bubble a bit more. Um, so we know from particularly over the Amazon fires in the summer, um, consumers were very much interested in ensuring that their products were not associated with deforestation. So we saw that companies including BF Corp and H&M made statements um, about ensuring that their products would no longer would not be deforestation related. Um, so we were really wanting to capitalize on that consumer interest. Um, so we've been reaching out through social media, so sharing lots of key statistics um, and links to the report, uh, particularly on Twitter. Um, but we're also really engaging with consumers through uh, online newspaper articles. Um, so, and also we are, you know, we try to make a report much more consumer facing and link it to the products and the brands that we all know and use very often that are actually Without our, often without our knowledge, contributing to deforestation and really making that link clear um, so that consumers can understand better. Okay, thanks, thanks, Emma. Um, Sarah, perhaps a question from you for you here from uh, Nicole asking, um, can you remind us why you're no longer including local governments in the ranking and also what has changed in the methodology this year? So I think, I mean, Emma, you did cover some of that, but anything you want to add, Sarah, on... Um, methodology and specifically the inclusion of local governments? Yeah, so in 2014 to 2017, we did have 50 jurisdictions in our assessments. Um, and in 2018, we removed them for the, from the assessments and upped the number of companies that we assessed to maintain the sample at 500. Um, and the reason that we did that was that we found that countries and governments had such different contexts um, that it was kind of, it wasn't very useful to be comparing them uh, within these kinds of assessments. So we were giving them a score, but those scores weren't really, you know, they weren't telling us very much because it varied so much country to country. Um, so we still use countries, uh, we look at which high risk countries to focus on for our selection of companies. So when we're looking at which of the companies to assess, we'll look specifically at the ones operating in the key high risk countries. So we still do that process within the selection and we make that data available on our website, um, but we don't do an assessment of countries in the same way anymore. Um, yeah, I think Emma did touch on this, but this year we updated we, the methodology for how we assess companies. So we added a few and strengthened a few indicators to bring it in closer alignment with the accountability framework guidance. So we added, uh, two indicators on whether they report or have a target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from land use change. And we added one indicator on whether companies specified a cutoff date for deforestation. And then a couple of the other indicators we strengthened so that it was they had to specify in more detail to score the full points. So many companies dropped points this year, not because they changed their commitments, but because they didn't score for our new indicators. Okay, thanks. Um, while we're on methodology, um, there is another question here from Eric at Equalizer Foundation asking uh, to what extent we interact with uh, companies rated, um, whether the review is all paper based. So Emma, do you want to um, talk to that one? Yeah, of course. So in line with our methodology, we do not interact with the companies or financial institutions before our data or report is published. Um, so we only use information uh, that they have made publicly accessible on their websites. Um, so we look through their policies, all of their website pages, and any information that's there, if it qualifies according to our methodology, we will include it, but we will not interact with the companies or ask for their feedback before we publish our data. Um, we do, of course, after it's published, interact with companies then um, and engage them 
with their score and the methodology a bit more, um, but not before it's published. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, Sam and Leah, there are some questions here which perhaps um, you, yeah, you would like to uh, comment on. So, a good question here from Charlotte Opal asking about companies um, which can effectively become deforestation free by purchasing from older farms that were deforested long ago. And Charlotte is asking, um, shouldn't you be campaigning to get major brands to be forest positive instead? So they should be actively uh, so protecting forests equivalent to their plantation footprint. Um, so yeah, if you want to pick that question up, that's a good one. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Um, yeah, for, yeah, sorry, it's something I probably should have included. So although le legislation is the primary focus of, you know, stop deforesting, there is a massive piece on restoration that we don't with NGOs uh, generally we can't we can't really agree on what companies should be doing obviously um, we see it as, a, as an opportunity for companies to kind of stay in the landscape that they have played a part in degrading um, we want them to to remove deforestation from supply chains completely and then um, go that extra step further and once they do that by 2021 we hopefully through uh, hopefully through legislation um, they have there'll be like another uh target to restore or um what's the terminology to be on a pathway to restoration by 2030 um what that means i mean there's an there's, there's an, an array of initiatives out there as to you know, for what companies can get involved in um but yeah that, you're absolutely right that is a massive part of, of how companies um can be involved and how we empower companies to, to stay involved um post you know 2021 po post that uh, achieving that um zero deforestation and I would um, jump in from the accountability framework perspective to say that this is it's definitely again an important question. Um, and as with with many things, it's a it's a both and sort of question where um, we you know are working to ask companies to try to remove deforestation from their supply chains, but we also um, sort of balance that with with several other of our principles in our sort of list of twelve core principles. And one of our one of our principles is about. Um, uh, collaboration for broader impact is, is sort of what we call it and a big component of that is that we do ask companies to remain engaged in high-risk landscapes where they are active um, and to work toward to implement broader improvement in that region so that is something that we also um, include in our list of sort of essential components of um, responsible sourcing so that's something something that we include we also have principles on long-term protection of landscapes and, and restoration and compensation for, for past harms that the companies caused or contributed to. So um, this is certainly um, a, bigger, a bigger piece than just shifting, shifting your suppliers to um, older, you know, quote, low risk um, areas. So um, both are certainly a component of the way we look at this big picture from our side. Um, thanks, Leah. So um, there's another question here, which I think is probably um, best for you, um, asking really about also global definitions, asking um, it would be important to have a global definition of forest and in turn deforestation uh, as, you know, as a way of comparing commitments even. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <I'll take laughs> for you. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, the accountability framework has, has done exactly that. Um, we have a set of definitions that are um, consensus based among all of the organizations that were part of our steering group. Um, so, and the, the definitions that we spent the most time developing were definitions on, for example, forest and deforestation. So I would really encourage people to look at not only our definitions, but we also provide a, a full set of operational guidance on the application of those definitions. Um, our forest definition, for example, is, is fairly broad, but um, we give an outline that allows for sort of robust national, regional, sectoral definitions that fit within that, um, that set of criteria to be used. So it's not sort of a one size fits all definition. It's, it's really a, a set of criteria that can be used to assess, what, assess whether existing definitions are, um, are robust enough to, to be used. Um, so that's certainly something that we do. We also, again, have a, have a definition of deforestation, but then we also provide a great deal of guidance um, on 
what sorts of land use change might be considered definition. We have a table of, sort of, excuse me, considered deforestation, we provide a table of sort of boundary cases where we sort of say, is this definition, is this deforestation, is this not deforestation? So we really have put quite a great deal of thought in trying to standardize uh, what people are talking about when they're talking about deforestation. So I would really urge people interested in that, conversa in that conversation to, to take a look at the accountability frameworks definitions as well as the um, operational guidance on applying those definitions because this is a really important piece of the puzzle is that when we're talking about de deforestation, we all need to be talking about the same thing um, or this will never work. So um, yeah, thanks for that question. And just to build on that, yeah, I think because of the, yeah, the incredible kind of uh, the terminology and definitions that have been developed by AFI, this is something that we are trying to push to government as well to adopt. Um, so when we talk about deforestation and, and, uh, and forest, um, from WWF's perspective anyway, and these are the definitions that government will be receiving from us and from the NGOs that are, are part of that um, accountability framework initiative. So hopefully they'll adopt it <laughs> into their amendments. And so it'll, it'll kind of be set in law as well. I should probably mention, I haven't yet, that WWF is, WWF is part of the AFI steering group. <laughs> um, I know they made that connection, but. But not me though. <laughs> yeah, we, we are, but uh, yeah, I think, I think it's someone, someone in the US office, but uh, yeah. Um, great, thanks. So we've, um, we're running out of time, but I do want to take a couple more questions. So here's one um, which uh, Richard has sent in. 48% um, is a huge number. So 48% referring to the number of the percentage of uh, companies with at least one deforestation commitment who didn't report on their progress to implement them. So Richard is asking, 48% is a huge number. What can be done to help these companies see the benefit in reporting on their progress? Um, because yeah, we really do need to know. Uh, so yeah, what what can we do for them to see the benefit in reporting? Sarah, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can kick it off, but it'd be great to hear what Sam and Leah think as well. I think um, obviously Forest 500 has a, a big role to play in that, in that we are keeping an eye on these companies and tracking what they're doing and ranking them on that each year. So we are showing the case for why they should be communicating with us and being, you know, letting us know about, letting everyone know about the progress that they're making towards their commitments um, and that they are being held to account for that. Yeah, anyone want to add to that? I can, uh, I can jump in. Yeah, you go, you go. Okay. Um, just to say that um, the you know the way that accountability you know we talked about accountability accountability a lot over here and you know the way that works is that by providing information you can be both held accountable for achieving your commitments um, but also um, you know rewarded and incentivized for making progress and I think that um, we need to figure out what the um, uh, you know what the what the carrots are that we that we have to offer. I think for companies that are reporting, even if they are not, um, even if not there yet, even if they're not um, fulfilling their their commitments fully, um, companies that that do report open themselves up to to greater scrutiny, opening themselves up to being campaigned against. And there's a lot of um, negatives from the company perspective in terms of um, you know beginning to report to you know go from no transparency to a little bit of transparency is, is, a, is a big step with a lot of um, sort of downside risk. So figuring out ways to, um, you know, again, I think, the, you know, the way the accountability framework operates is very much on the stepwise, you know, set milestones, set targets, um, work through an implementation pathway. And if we can improve the way that we um, recognize, recognize those, those stepwise processes, um, it creates a lot more incentive for, for companies that aren't yet really doing any of that implementation reporting to do so. So figuring out what that balance is, is, is difficult, but something that, um, you know, for this sort of accountability loop to work where companies report and then we can all make better decisions based on that. There needs to be some feedback to the companies to incentivize that further. Thanks. Thanks. So we are on the hour, but I'm tempted to ask one more question. We've got so many come in and there are so many which are really good. And I'm going to ask a question which maybe has quite a short answer. Um, so James Hand is asking, uh, he says, looking at the report, uh, no company gets five out of five. 
So what does that mean for sort of consumer choices? Does it mean that no one, we can't really buy from any company on the list and know that it's truly deforestation free? So maybe quick responses to that question. Sarah? Yeah, I can kick off. I mean, the quick answer is no, it's not easy for consumers to know that they're buying deforestation free products. And unfortunately, none of the companies that we're looking at are scoring the full points. So they're not scoring for strong commitments and strong implementation. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that's one of, I'll hand over to Sam, but I think that's definitely one of their, their points in their campaign as well. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> that's what we're basing the campaign around is that we cannot guarantee that that the food we isn't doesn't contain deforestation, um, even if company commitments are are, are kind of progressive, um, and that's how we engage consumers. Consumers aren't aware. First of all, they're not aware that deforestation and food are linked, and second of all, they wouldn't be able to walk into a shop and pick any pick a food that they can be certain about and that's uh, we see that as um or we're kind of trying to frame it at least as as un unacceptable um we shouldn't have destruction in our food um habitat destruction in our food um and that is kind of a no-brainer really yeah i think it's also important to note that from a consumer perspective just because we can't but we, we know we can't buy anything that's guaranteed deforestation free but it's really important that instead of boycotting those products and those brands that we actually encourage consumers to engage with them. Yes, Sounds absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think just linking back to make sure businesses and supply chains are on board as well. We don't want to, we don't want to paint a negative picture. We want to, we want to try and empower everybody involved. Obviously there is, yeah, as you mentioned before, there is a carrot and stick to that. There is a balance, um, which we hope to find. Um, but yes, absolutely. The, 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 Moving away from soy or palm oil, it could be just as destructive. Um, we, if we already have the infrastructure, it's just a case of making the infrastructure more sustainable. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. So we are unfortunately going to have to stop there because we've just run out of time. Um, but thanks to everyone who has sent in questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of them, but we were, will, where possible, actually try to get back to you via email. Um, otherwise, please look out for our NGO pack of social assets, which we'll be sending you following the webinar, and we'll um, send out the recording as well, which, of course, you can share with anyone who wasn't able to join today. Um, and don't forget to check out the new website, which Sarah showed. Um, it's forest500.org. And as ever, we'd of course love you to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn, where there are more updates and insights. So a special thank you to today's speakers. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Sam, Sarah, and Emma. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for coming. Thanks. Great. Bye. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.